so let it be written, so let it be done. This is Tabletop Terrors, and today we're going to do some live game design. Um, we are going to be working on a system uh, that I came up with a couple years ago and have worked on it on and off called the 5-Minute RPG. And the goal is, the main design goal for the 5-Minute RPG is to have an RPG that you could pull off the shelf on a Friday night and play it as quickly and easily as you would most casual board games, but still have the narrative feeling and the RPG experience. Uh, and that's it. That's kind of the goal. And so everything we're going to talk about today is wet cement. We are just brainstorming. And the system has come a long way conversationally in our WhatsApp. But today we're going to just really talk about we've come to a place where the system itself has some good bones where we feel like it's quick to set up it's pretty easy to understand the resolution mechanic seems like it's there and now though we are coming to a place where the question is can you have a system that's very simple but still have character design choices matter and so we're in a place where we're trying to figure out powers. What makes a wizard different from a mage? No, that's the same thing. <laughs> what makes... But it's not, right? Well, I guess it's not. If there's, But that that's the perfect... That, that's It makes it the perfect example. Because to some people it is and some people it isn't. And it's Got definition em. is what... Yeah. I did so it no, on purpose. Perfect. No, I didn't. I meant to say what makes a wizard different than a, and then I wasn't going to say barbarian. I was going to say ninja, and mage is what came out. So Too many choices. But that's the idea. And so I want to throw it to you both. Obviously, if we need to describe certain parts of the system to explain how powers work, we will. But we didn't want this to be an info dump explaining the, the rules as they are. More the concept in design principle. In a simple system, without making it complex, how can I differentiate two characters so they feel like the choices they made at character creation matter and in the game matter and are fun? And that's, I'll throw it to you too. Well, how do we do that in the five-minute RPG? So if you put Jeff and I in an arena and said we had to fight to the death to see who could talk first, uh, hopefully his internet dropped so it's me. No. Um... <laughs> I feel like it's a good spot to pause, but I guess I'm going to continue because I don't know. But either way, um, I want to say a few things before we get started to try and put us on the same page. Uh, I wanted to set out a few goals. So the thing I wanted to say first is, um, in general, I feel like in, in the five-minute RPG, if we give players powers, we should decide what they do mechanically only, right? We should only give as much as we need to. I mean, in that way, I think we'll open up and we'll be able to see this later, open up more abilities for the player to customize their own person, you know, or uh, character in whatever sense without affecting the rules. Okay. So like an example that you and I were talking about was if a player has a weapon that shoots, don't call it a gun, just call it a ranged projectile weapon, weapon or a projectile example, weapon, yeah. or if it is a you know, a bladed weapon, you just say that. You're good with blades, so then it could be swords or daggers or axes, and that is extremely near shuriken. Like, you yeah, know, be it, as it, broad as you can be and try to see if you need to be more specific and then stop there. Because <laughs> if you go, oh, well, that doesn't fit this one, yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's a good baseline too, especially because at that point, you can, even if the mechanics end up in a similar space, like, narrative feel can differentiate characters a lot too so if i'm playing a ninja and you're playing a wizard uh and the end result of whatever mechanic we use is that we each deal one more damage you know there can still be an infinite number of ways that that will be very different because you know i'm going to use my smoke bomb and teleport behind them and attack them with my shuriken versus you're going to use your fireball and lightning and you know whatever it is that like just allowing people that freedom to say like, hey, like this looks how you want it to look, you know, and you can describe it however you want to. That will already differentiate a lot just because people describe and gravitate towards very different things with those sorts of freedoms. Um, now, that's not to say that we don't have to worry about mechanics at all then, because obviously we still do. 
and we can get into that in a little bit. But I do think what James said is a very good starting point, which is like, yeah, give people the freedom to make it their own. And at that point, like, even if we're both playing ninjas, our ninja powers will look different from each other because I'm not going to go to the same place that you will. So, yeah, I think it's very important. Um, and just, it gives people the freedom to make the characters their own, uh, which will already, independent from the rules, I think give them a lot of like ownership and control uh, in their own mind of like, no, I'm different from them because what I do looks and feels and sounds different <laughs> to them, you know? And I think as a part of the rules, exactly what you're saying, the more things we uh, specify in that way, we're just pointing at, right? Hey, you as the player can make this up. We're giving them the space they're allowed to play in. Um, they don't. They they know the limits, right? We're we're they're bowling with bumpers. Um, the the other thing I wanted to say was, we to answer your question, Tim, of how do we make uh, powers that matter, right? To some degree, we won't go crazy here, right? But we have to talk about what a game is. Game theory generally is sort of the. Um, the best decision to make given a set of circumstances. And a lot of times role-playing games don't have perfect solutions because so many things are unknown. What we want to do is even if, even if the thing the player decides doesn't do something, mm -hmm. to some degree, some of the fun was the decision for the player. And that was a, just a design concept I wanted us to remember when we're trying to answer kind of a big question, more or less, how do we make this game fun? <laughs> right sure how to make the powers in the game fun um and i just wanted to point out sometimes that we don't always we don't always have the same idea of what the where the fun is right yeah yeah and so one thing that i did want to mention and i i may have prematurely changed this when i was kind of catching you both up on where the game ended up so it's a very simple mechanic the kind of it's a high success system so there's already a lot of success and excuse me right now because there's a d4 and all of the stats are your dice the way it was before was that one of your stats was a d4 and essentially you couldn't succeed unless you did other stuff you know you had a bad stat that you just weren't good at um so to fix that solution i might have chosen the wrong solution so the way that when this play tested, uh, we were in Seattle and when, when we play tested this, of the dice that you placed, you took the D8 and made it your powers die. So that anytime you could conceivably say, I'm using my powers, my ninja powers, instead of rolling whatever else you rolled, you could roll the D8. Uh, I, I hate to be a stickler, but I was there. Oh, we did not use the D8 for that. What was it? It was the other D10. Oh, <laughs> God, no, that's important. No, that's perfect, but okay, That's yeah. important to know. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but, yeah. thank you. No, listen, that's important. And be a stickler. Because yeah. <laughs> in my head, it was the D8. So, okay. So, my point was. because yeah, there are two D10s. So, one of the D10 stats was a stat, and the other D10, the D100, was the power. That makes sense. So, that makes a lot of sense. So what I found that did was it let people be extremely narrative and really describe their power. It incentivized them to use and describe their powers every turn. Yeah. And so I didn't have a solution to having a D4 in one of the stats. I didn't know if that mattered. But let's put a pin in that for a second and just say – the system that I was pitching you all, not the one that we played in Seattle, but the system that I was pitching you all was take the D4 and make it the power die and add it to a roll. I kept thinking, though, over and over, it's such a high success system that will that really make you feel like you're powerful if you're already going to succeed without using your powers pretty often? Exactly. Is that doing anything? And mm -hmm. I kept thinking, I don't think it is. And so do you think that it is better to use the d10 and let the players if they can feasibly describe narratively how 
whatever their powers are, whether it's, and when I say power, I don't mean listing them out. I mean, it's like your powers are that you're a mage and that's your power. And however you can explain to me how the mage does that, I will let you use the D10, which essentially ups your percentage of success in most cases. Um, do you think that that's better? So I, I do like the approach that we've gotten to now, I think, more in the sense of just the, the downside to having the power dice be so high and to replace whatever you use is that you can very easily get to a point where none of your choices matter because you always use the power die. So it doesn't matter if I put a D4 or a D6 or a D8 or a D10 in what stats, because I'm not going to use those stats. I'm going to use my powers, because those are more fun to describe and better mechanically. So why not just do that at every possible opportunity? And because it's so lenient, that's going to be most situations I'm going to be able to use my power. So I do like the idea that you still have to actually make choices on your stats that matter, and then the power does something to that. Now, where we kind of ended up is that the power will also do something else. So it's not just adding a D4 and that's it. You know, it also might change the way a certain rule works in a certain situation. So you might deal an extra point of success against your challenge, or you might avoid the next point of damage, you know, however it ends up being specifically. But for me, at least, that's a more satisfying angle. For one, it gives you more things to do and choices to make of like, okay, I'm going to pick this power that does this thing, which for me is more fun than just I roll the same dice and I get the same success. I just talk about it differently. Yeah, that's very, very good. That's a very valid point. So I think um, <clears throat> that to have this conversation and make some decisions, we need to start um, uh, defining a few things because uh, a lot of what you said there, Jeff, right, right now we have resolution system, high success, um, and even without a playset, right? So the way I imagine the five-minute RPG working uh, to both of you and I guess to, to viewers is if you're playing without a playset, you're making up all the stuff, right? So there would be, you would know what things you might need, but you would be making the decisions. This is how D&D works now. If you want to play Dungeons and Dragons, you need a world you know, for it to be in. That's not the rules. The reason I say that is because if you split it up that way, the world can have the rules. What I'd like to do is talk about a case where a player would use a power and then try to make mechanics for it. Because what we already have is people doing a lot of stuff. So maybe that's a good argument for maybe Maybe what I think of as a power is different than what you do, right? So we should define the word power and what we want it to do. And then separately, maybe have a conversation about what this other thing is that actually doesn't have anything to do with success or failure, but is another choice the players get to make. So yeah, one, we should define totally what fair. powers. Um, sure. Well, and there's a little bit of meta. There's a little bit of meta. And that can be something that I don't want to get hung up on. I want to just hang mm -hmm. a lantern on it on purpose. The meta is that the way you make your character so quickly is you take one of each of the denomination of dice and put it in five stats. So that is why the D4 is hanging out somewhere. Mm -hmm. I want to decouple that from the idea that the D4 has to be related to the powers. Yeah, yeah. The D4 and can be something fair, totally yeah. different. So I just want to say until that. Until we find something, yeah, for the D4, for now, we'll assume it won't even be in the game. Sure, and that's fair too. Like whatever. Because if we have to find a place for it, that's okay, right? But sure. yeah, exactly. Yep. So I just wanted to say mm -hmm. that something we had discussed previously was that this was definitely going to be like a power thing. It can, it doesn't have to be. So I want to just say that. Um, so actually, this is a, a good um, uh, time to say this. In that, to me, is a a we'll call that putting a pin in it. That yeah, that's a yeah. perfect word, right? But this would be. For us to have a better conversation, we're putting a pin in that because we don't need to know it now. Yep. And I just, because now we can more quickly say that in the future. So, sorry, go ahead. Um, so, you're asking me, like, what is a situation where a player might use a power? Yeah, okay. So, and, and you going through the character creation, I can ask a more specific question if you yeah. want. You described somebody was a mage. Mm -hmm. 
I think that we should talk about what that is in the system and what that gives them and then decide how that affects what becomes their powers. Does that make sense? It makes a ton so of sense. So how do you become a mage? Right. And in that's, the system. In the system. You probably pick from a list maybe. <clears throat> yeah, I think the way we did it and <laughs> Jeff, you might remember better than me. The um the way that we did it in Seattle is that you chose a certain number of words that were your powers. So like there were three lines or four lines on the sheet or something and you could be like a robot ninja and then that gave you maybe it was even like plus one or something on your stats and then you could use your power basically it was it was just a simple word where you're like you say you're a robot and you're a robot it was like choose two words you would just kind of give yourself a couple tags basically of like what you were and like what tools you would have on hand that would help you basically so i might be you know a cyborg ninja with like AI programming, you know, and like that was like my list of three things. And so you could basically use a power if one of those words would basically be able to trigger some some cool moment basically in the game. So if I wanted to like have some crazy, I teleport behind them with my sword and I cut like I could do that because I'm a ninja, you know, and that's a ninja thing to do. If I describe myself as doing that, I could use the power die instead of the normal die. So, and, and there was one other thing, I think, and Jeff, I, I did this in some of the games, and I tried it without it in others, so maybe I didn't do this in yours. But what I also did, James, was for each, you could add up to three or whatever lines or, or words, and then you chose what ability that would improve and added a plus one next to it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this you could is all perfect, right? So you could say because he has AI, he gets a plus one to his intelligence, and because he's a ninja, he gets a plus one to his quick or whatever I called it. Yeah. And because he's a cyborg, he gets plus one to his strength. And there were no rules. So, you could have like plus three on smart and just be the smartest. So, but again, it was such a high success system. At the time, it rolled really well, and people were like, "I feel like I can do anything," but I feel like it wouldn't hold up to. A long-term play my opinion and and here's what i see um and we'll see if this makes sense what you did was you told the players the rules and it was kind of a little bit of a um trial and error this may not have actually happened but imagine a player said i want to be uh galactus you might say no, no no you can't be galactus you both didn't know the rules until one of you broke them What we want to do is take those same rules that you kind of vaguely have Mm -hmm. and make them into a playset. Yes. What you said is, right? So, okay, what that means is imagine instead of the person having to come up with it, they can pick from a list. So what I'm seeing is to be a mage, you go, okay, I'll pick from a list of things you can be in this playset. Mage and barbarian for this one. I picked mage. Under mage are some of those things that you guys described, right? There's three lines in this case. So we'll say the first one's mage. The second one is a tool they get. The third one is a power they get, whatever. The thing is, your players chose them from lists they made up, but it doesn't matter where they came from. The mechanics remain the same. The reason I say all that is because all we're doing is defining what things players can pick, but giving them free range to pick among those. Um, So, Can can I mention one thing too for anybody watching? So what we found, and James made a very good distinction about certain systems... They try to stay general and also cover every instance that could happen. And what we're trying to do now with the 5-Minute RPG is create a simple core system that can be used, like you say, to make anything. So not something as complex as some of the other systems that have been released like this. And then getting a lot of the specificity and flavor from playsets which would just be exactly what you said. Specific sets of information that would be character classes with powers, maybe locations, very thematic stuff that you're off to the races and all of them use the same core mechanics so that it can be either or. You can either make your own or use one of these play sets. And I think what you're saying, James, is that really making the powers specific to the play sets could take a lot of work off of trying to make the core system do all the heavy lifting on it and work with everything. Yes, and, and in general, I, I wanted to uh, uh, 
illustrate to you guys that to some degree when you're designing this type of thing that's narrative and you want to rein in, what I like to do is just give spaces for the, the players to fill and then see if those things work, right? Or derive things from one choice they make. So everything you said, um, I just also wanted to point out that this type of game design isn't number-based. It's, it's a little more um, social, I guess. We want to define the types of things a player, the rules we need allow a player to know what they can choose if there's not a list. So all we need to do right now, I guess the next step is we need to call that thing about your character something. You're a mage, what is that? Your For now, you could just call it a specialty. Specialty, that's perfect. A vague word because some words would be specified in rule sets, sort of flavor, you know, that would be your, that could be your class. In D&D, that's your class. But it, broadly, it's your specialty, right? In a Game of Thrones game, it could be like your house. Uh, yeah. Or, you know. So basically that is separate. We, 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 it felt maybe like that was part of powers, but it's not. We want that to have to do with powers. Um, but basically now that we know that, now if we describe a situation in the game where we could see being a mage mattering, we can decide what those mechanics should look like. That makes sense. So you're, are you asking for like a play loop? Yeah. Uh, so basically we can start to like look at kind of what the gameplay is at right now and kind of see where powers might slot into all that to try to figure out kind of what the actual end goal here is. Uh, and this is something we've talked about a little bit before off camera. So I'm going to try to catch us up to where we were then and kind of see if we can continue from there. So the basic sort of loop of the game is, you know, in any scene, there will be some challenge that needs to be overcome. Now that'll vary from playset to playset or whatever you make up. So it could be a battle. It could be to hack a computer. It could be a courtroom that you're trying to convince a judge to, you know, give a certain verdict. It could be anything. Uh, but to basically win a scene, each challenge in that scene needs to be overcome. And to do that, you have to get successes against that challenge. And you do that by rolling your dice. So if we're trying to break into a computer, I can look and say, oh, I have a really high intelligence. So I'm going to use my intelligence stat and I'm going to roll against that challenge. Uh, and as long as you get a five or above, you get a point against it. You know, so. I roll my dice, I get a six or whatever. Okay, I win, so I get one point against the computer, and you need X number of points to hack into it and defeat the challenge, basically. So kind of where we're hoping powers will slide into this is right now, if I'm a wizard and you're a hacker, if we both roll intelligence against the computer, the end result of that is exactly identical. It doesn't matter if I use my magic to try to do some spell, and if you use your computer wizardry to, you know, hack into the code, or whatever it is. I'm not a hacker. <laughs> I think that'll be very obvious. He's a wizard. He's um, clearly a wizard. He doesn't yeah. know how to hack. That's what he's describing, yeah. guys. He's clearly <laughs> yeah. a wizard. So right now, that choice is basically irrelevant to the mechanics. Like, as long as you succeed on your role, the end result is exactly the same, no matter what you are. So kind of what we're hoping for powers to do is add that one extra thing of like, no, well, because I'm a wizard, I can, you know, use protective magic and that'll prevent one damage against me, you know, versus if you're the hacker, you might get an extra success when you use your intelligence because it's your, you know, so fi finding that one sort of extra layer to say like, it not only matters to the narrative that I'm a wizard and you're a hacker, but it changes the, the mechanics, even just one tiny little layer. It doesn't need to be some big dramatic change to the rules, but like if I roll intelligence and get a success against the computer, and you roll intelligence and get a success against the computer, that's the same thing. But if we use our powers to use that intelligence, that should theoretically make for some difference. And whatever that difference is, how big or small, or at what point in the gameplay chain that power takes place, you know, is all still being figured out but that's sort of at least where i see the design goal at is how can we make it so that power will add the difference between my intelligence check against the computer and your intelligence check against the computer 
based off of what our concept or our specialty is. Does that make sense? So with everything that Jeff said, what we also have so that you're aware of a couple of nuances that might change that play loop. Every challenge has something that they are um, vulnerable to, I guess we'll say, that you do double your point. So like if a computer is vulnerable to intelligence, you get to do two against it. And then there will be one thing per what we're calling a scene right now that has an invulnerability to make it feel like a boss monster if there was some like, uh, you know, an, another mage, a really good mage, they would have invulnerability so that you can't use your intelligence against them unless or whatever, something like that. And so we're playing with those are the dials to make things also feel like the challenges are slightly different so that if you are smart, using your intelligence against something that is vulnerable to intelligence makes you feel like that matters. So that's also important as we talk about the plot, the powers. So a lot of it, I'm going to actually start writing things down. Mm -hmm. uh, just because write me a game. Jeff Seamus. made <laughs> me realize, no, no, no. Uh, um, Jeff, what did you say? You made me realize. Looks like you should have wrote it down little, sooner. I know. Yeah, I realized um, how little it takes. And Tim, you made me realize. Uh, what did you just say? You, <laughs> that I hate um, you. <laughs> I was saying vulnerabilities no, 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 and saying invulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities yes. And vulnerabilities. Okay. I wanted to know about that. So, okay. So first, Tim, I want to tell you uh, something. The idea that you landed on for vulnerability and in invulnerability. Uh, we haven't talked about this yet. So <laughs> I'm going to say it for you uh, uh, and, and everyone everybody else right it's a good idea but not only because of what it does to the mechanics you have created a rule that a player will have a hard time forgetting because there's one thing and it's opposite as the other side and conceivably it's inverse on both sides it either does double or it does half that rule is easy to remember we're going to put a pin in this but later we are going to make very complex rules that are easy because we know how that works. Jeff, you made me realize uh, something I wanted to say, everyone. This is a game that's been played, right? We've effectively talked about all the mechanics that exist in this game right now. And you've played sessions of it and they were fun and they were amazing. And I just wanted to illustrate that real quick because we haven't even begun in earnest designing the game and it already works as a game and it's awesome. So I just wanted to say that that's more game design does not always mean better, right? So I just wanted to point that out because uh, Jeff said that. So, but what you're describing, Tim, with the vulnerability and invulnerability is what I think the next step is. We start looking at what types of things we can simulate and decide if they're things we want to simulate or not. Right now, you have players that are generally very strong, having a lot of successes. So as you guys said, giving them more success doesn't feel like the way to go, which is fair. Um, here's where having a menu helps, right? I'm going to list a few things that I think you guys will get, but I may lose some people. Um, but we'll have to start deciding. Some things I've seen in cases like this, this is where we have what's called economies coming in. If you remember from earlier, I mentioned that sometimes the fun is not in the player doing the thing. It's not the success. It's in how they got there. If a player can gamble on whether or not they'll do it well enough and say, roll a lower level die, that would be fun for them, whether or not it changes the game. So just, but that that concept, right? If they fail, it was still fun because they they were betting against the dice that their character could do it. I just want to point that out because maybe in taxing some resource, right? P players currently don't have any resources, but the ability to spend something you have to make somebody else not be able to succeed might be a really big deal. But the idea is you just identify what types of economies you can have and decide what decisions you want the players to make, right? We know how success works. We probably don't want to add something to that unless we have a really great epiphany. So what else can players be doing? And bonus points, if you can work this into counter, what else are players doing that we can play with? Yeah, so one of the points that we kind of had for powers so far, which is like, 
one well one issue i'll start with an issue and kind of where we're trying to go with it is like the game is so streamlined and so simple that there's not a lot of dials that you can turn that won't like drastically start to break something like very very soon on in the process which which complicates the design of it a little bit when it comes to powers of like it's very easy in D&D to say okay you get an extra d6 or you paralyze them or you poison them or you they're knocked prone or they make us you know there's tons of dials that you can all start to turn and like turning one a little bit is probably not going to break the game whereas with this what we very quickly started to see is like there's just not a whole lot you can give people mechanically and what you do has to be very small in increment because it starts to like the numbers are so small and low that you know any dial that you turn on them is going to make a big impact. So if something only has three you know, points that you need to get against it, and any die roll gives you one point, like the jump from one point to two points is a pretty big gap. So we've kind of ended up in this point where we sort of have only a small number of things that we can give people. So we have you know, hit points, so you can like heal or prevent damage, you know, you can increase the number of damage that you do. And I'm using damage knowing that that's, you know, it's not always going to be attacks against a, a, an enemy, that sometimes it'll just be a task against an object, you know. But I'll say damage to simplify, yeah. Yeah. Or you can, like, you know, if you want to play with, like, the success of it, you know, you could give somebody basically, like, an extra action versus an extra damage, which, like, the end result is the same, but the the odds you know of probability change slightly in terms of whether or not you'll get certain things kind of where we were ending up is like you'll probably the power will probably have to change slightly one of those rules you know you heal a hit point you get an extra action you do an extra damage you prevent an enemy from acting you know and like there's kind of only a small list of options because of how simple the game is so we kind of have to keep them reined in in terms of what they even can do because it'll very quickly start to degrade the entire system if you make them crazy. Um, so that gives us a limited palette, which I think is a plus and a minus. Uh, it's less differentiation between different powers, you know, if you only have so many that you can even have. But it does also make it a lot simpler to basically make a menu that people can pick from of like, kind of where we've ended up so far. So to say all that, to get to sort of where we're at right now, when you make your character, there's just a list of what your power will change. Basically, what rule will your power change? And you get to pick that one. And then you can describe your power however you want to, knowing that it'll get that extra effect. So if I'm a ninja and I pick two extra actions, maybe that's just because I'm so fast that I can make two attacks in a round instead of one at the same rate. Versus if I'm a warrior, maybe I deal an extra damage because I'm just super strong. And you could switch those powers and still find narrative justifications for how they work. But basically, the, the, where we're ending up right now with powers is your power allows you to modify one of those fundamental increments in one way or another You know when you use your power. And we haven't decided if there's a limit to how many times you can do that or when you can use it versus when you can't. That's all still kind of hazy. But that's kind of at least where we had ended up so far. Uh, now that's not set in stone. So we can absolutely break that down into pieces and try a, a different approach if that immediately sort of sets any flags off. So what you described, Jeff, right, is, is we have a system right now that's too broad. So let's start specifying some things. Something I want to say is, so if we do it right, complexity in a game Proportional to how complex it is, Jeff's rule. I'm, this is this is Jeff's rule. Jeff's rule. Proportional to how complex it is, it will be um, simple. I forgot what I was saying. I got so caught up in Jeff's rule. I don't want you to be afraid of us adding complexity to the system because we will be careful. I'm going to say that now too. We need to start defining some of the things in the system. D and D actually kind of does this, but they don't do it enough. For example. Some powers are clear which ones, when, when you can use them, right? Some powers are in combat. You can hit anything with a sword at any time, but you can't technically use the mechanics of healing word on somebody not in combat. I mean, again, you can, but that's what's funny is that's hazy, right? It should be more specific. What you're describing, the idea that changing one little thing changes too much means we need to start putting walls. Um, 
or, and this is like where pin, we can go down, down, either, down either of these paths. We can start doing things like saying what can happen in phases. It won't be, we won't, they aren't rules, they're descriptions. And we'll get to that in a minute. But what we can do is we'll start putting up walls and some powers will be able to reach over the walls and some won't, kind of like D&D. But as long as we're specific, a player will always be able to very clearly tell when they can do something. But in order for us to solve the problem you guys are describing, we have to decide some of the categories, right? Yeah. Letting the player decide the categories where it's going to start falling off. To the other way we can go with this is that's where I think we should start designing the game because that tells us what people can do and maybe that's play sets. The other thing is what you described, Jeff, is changing any of those dials can be a problem. But what you said, if you add to the role, it messes it up. But if you add or subtract from the successes in the system, it doesn't, right? There's a thing in programming called scope. We're going to call that scope. The scope of that sure. power, some, some scopes can be too broad. If you're changing something small and it changes broad, you need to rein it in. With that said, there are a lot of things we can do in a scene, but we need to talk about what kind of scene this is, just for an example, to start making these things up, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So combat is probably the most common one in RPGs, but it doesn't have to be that. Um, usually, okay, let's talk about what TV shows do and how I, some of my goals are to make them more uh, RPGs more like television shows and movies. Nothing ever stops for combat in TV shows. They're always still trying to solve the problem. So I think that as a design goal, we should be, we should try and intertwine those things so that as part of the system, you're going down the hallway shooting bad guys, right? Combat has not stopped the narrative. You're also talking, but you're also making decisions. It's just like D&D, but for some reason in D&D, we stop everything because there was a grid once, I think is why. But we stop everything and we go, you're fighting and maybe you can have a conversation, but kind of everything stops. You can make checks, but it doesn't really fit. I would like, I think the five minute RPG should be solving problems while fighting probably, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the nice things about sort of where the rules are at now is that it very much supports that sort of structure because the only thing really codified is there are challenges and your roles overcome those challenges. What specifically that is, is sort of irrelevant. Not, not irrelevant, but universal in the sense of we could be in a scene where the, we have two challenges that each require three successes and we each make roles to try to get each of those things to three successes. Now, if one of those challenges is hacking a computer and the other challenge is killing an enemy, Versus if one of, you know, so the gameplay core is identical, sort of regardless of what, but I think the need for phases is less necessary in this sort of game because all the phases mechanically are exactly identical. All scenes in the game are, we make these roles to get these challenges overcome. You could call those challenges whatever you want to. It could be a computer. It could be a guy with a sword. It could be convincing a person. And one scene could have three challenges that are one of each of those things. So what you decide to use your sort of action to do could be any of those. I'm using my turn to convince this guy. You're using your turn to attack the enemy. But this is all happening at once. And, and real yeah. quick, I just want to say the reason why I love that is because it immediately solves the problem that most engines try to be which is you have to create so many add-ons to use it in a different world or for a different purpose so like the genesis system was a really cool idea but to truly flesh out using all of the like engine you had to do so much work to make your own new world that did all these separate things mm -hmm. and so like i i think it's really neat and this is something, if we can, I want to keep this intact. You could play a scene in the five-minute RPG where you are kids in school getting in trouble and the three challenges are the three administrators that are going to expel you from school. And the, the core mechanic stays, one like, not 100%, but it stays so similar that I'm rolling against challenges and it's like, oh, the principal's mad and she's really, you know, 
that's really attractive because, and James, you said it so well, you could literally play this in line at the movies. And that's and, neat to me. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out to exclamation no, what and Jeff said. That, that's very good. And, and what you guys are describing is the system. What I guess I'm saying is in order to responsibly design that system, you don't have to decide what the phases are. You just have to decide what they can be, right? This won't ever make it to the book. But the idea is to start making the decisions. Tim, that exact example. If you're in the administrator, right? You have the three administrators that you have to convince to let you out of school. In fact, let's take a situation from a TV show because we also get to add in the narrative fun. Um, you're a kid and you're in the uh, principal's office. The receptionist, you have to distract her so that you can run away. Hmm. That's your successes, right? Now, I might have one way to do it and you might have another way to do it. And what we want is for some reason, one of us needs to be better at distracting her. Now, the thing yeah. is, that's where we would never say, oh, well, in a case where you're the administrator, you're against the administrator. What we would instead say is when the type of phase is a conversation, I'm not hitting her physically because in the type of game that we're describing in school, it, there probably would not be physical combat, at least not with administrators. You see what I mean? Like, sure. By knowing that we would know, okay, well, we need, in order to make that gameplay loop different, we need to make somebody better at X. In this case, a conversation. And in this, so so to just kind of hit on that real quick, and then Jeff, I'll let you go. So we already have that, and that's why powers are orphaned, because technically, it's I could have better charisma. I have a D12 in charisma, so my chances are better of distracting or talking to that person by sake of my die being different. So the powers have to interact with that or do something different or make that matter differently or something. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So so let's talk about what it looks like then, right? Because the let's talk about what the resolution system feels like. What you described is anytime you're playing the game, mm -hmm. there's a scene and there are challenges mm -hmm. and they have numbers and you have to count successes up to those numbers. Is Correct. everything I've said true so far? Yeah. Those are the yeah. rules of the game. Yes. So what we want to do is we want to change that in some way. That already works. So exactly what you're saying, Tim, but that's what we want is getting successes is easy in the system. So what I want to do is looking at an example, we're trying to convince the woman to leave. It's funny because I feel the impulse to say this. In the show, they always describe some 90s artist is out in the parking lot and she just can't help herself and she goes out there because she would never forgive herself if she wouldn't. But... What I, what I want to try to describe is the idea that maybe in this system, it's not that somebody's better, but you're, let me back up. That's probably a good place to cut. So in this uh, thing that you described where we're trying to convince the woman to leave, in the five minute RPG, it's not one role like it is in D&D. &D. It's a lot. The whole thing is the resolution system itself builds attention in, even though we know as a part of the system, success is high. We're eventually going to do it. The fun is not in whether or not we convince her. It's whether we convince her quickly enough. It's whether we convince her well enough. It's whether she comes back soon. You can't solve for those things in a game, but you can make rules that make a player try to make better decisions for things that aren't rules. I see Jeff nodding and I'm glad because I'm like, that. that's a weird, ambiguous way to put it. But that's what we're looking for is, what if you could succeed more quickly? than having to roll. And if you roll, you can fail. I know that you can't necessarily, but also what if you could take something away from someone else, right? If it's opposed, as soon as you start setting up a few situations, like even as simple as we've done, you can see how a power could work. And if we do that enough, we can make a power that's broad enough to work in all of these situations, but specific enough that it makes players different. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I mean, basically, so I guess one quick part of the loop that I forgot to explain before that I'll add in because it'll start to color what powers can't even do is kind of what you say of like, people are probably going to succeed. So you'll, you will get to the, the, to the check mark. It's not like, will we get there or not? It's, you know, can we do it before? Yeah, exactly. So something that I forgot to mention before is basically once each player goes, you know, in whatever round, you know, whatever, however we structure, it probably rounds, you know, initiative of some sort, even if it's 
hazy made up to decide amongst yourselves. Pin that, yeah. Pin initiative, but once every player goes, the challenge basically taxes the player resource in some way. You know, whether that's hit points, we have just stamina, energy, whatever we want to call it. Again, pin that too of what the name is, but I'll, I'll use hit points because it's easy to understand. Even if hit points is usually specifically combat, it doesn't have to be. At the end, once every player has gone, all the challenges in the room exact some sort of effect back on the players. So maybe that's doing one point of hit points to one of the players. Maybe that's stopping the player from acting next turn. You know, there are a couple different things that it could be, um, but only, you know, one of three options or so, maybe. Not too many. Um, So that's just another thing that powers can basically play with, is like, you know, you when you make your roll, you can use your power, and that power is probably going to affect either the number of successes that you get, the number of things you can do, resisting or gaining back your hit point resource, or stopping a challenge from doing something. Like, those are kind of like the main dials that we have available. There might be a couple more that you could add to that list, you know, helping another person do better on their roll, you know, wh- whatever it is. There, are, There's... I'm not going to get too fixed on naming all of the possible options. But basically, I think that even just the difference between, like, when I make my roll, if I use my power, I get two successes, versus when you make a roll and use your power, you gain a hit point back. Like, that to me, even just, it's such a small mechanical difference, but I think, like, even just something like that is enough to separate you from me in terms of how our characters feel you know so it can still be extremely broad like i don't even you know think it has to come down to like when you use a certain dice in a certain situation like you get i don't I don't even think it has to be that you know specific of a of a use case for the powers and we can talk about that that's a different conversation but at least for me that's kind of at least the effect that i imagine powers having is one of those dials you get to exact a, a better toll against it, basically, whether that's getting an extra success, getting an extra action, preventing or gaining back hit points, or preventing the loss of hit points, something like that. And basically, which of those that you pick will depend on how you describe that power of acting and what concept you pick will decide which of those options you des- decide on picking. Uh, so there's still a lot of dials to play with there, but at least that's kind of where I saw it standing, if that makes sense. And again, this is all still what's the meant. That's perfect because that that concept of of the world hitting back is important, right? Because if the what that means is that the players don't act. If everybody passed their turn, they would die. Or or whatever would happen. Yeah. This is where, like I said, to have this conversation, I think we have to start talking some specific details, but separate what things are specific to the playset and what things go in the core set. That may be confusing if we try to do it but the important thing is a lot of the stuff you described isn't rules it's options and that uh, is where not having a very clear divide there is where some games mess up so what i would like to do is talk about some things you can play in the system and identify areas that would be fun to have decisions to make about what that means is we have to decide on a play set to be with I'm fine with it being kids in school. I think that we will have, actually, that might be simple. I think we should start with a play set, and I'd love to hear what you guys think about which one we should start with. Just, it doesn't matter, but we're going to just talk about uh, something that happens in that world. It can be fantasy. It can be, doesn't matter. Um, I can I come up with one, too. I, I was going to say, I don't know if you have a preference, but I always have, um, like, I was thinking, so that we don't have to world build using an existing intellectual property so that we're not having to decide, well, I don't know in this world is that, you know what I mean? So like, no, and that's good. So basically I was thinking like genre fantasy, right? I just fantasy combat. I was going to, okay, that's fine. And and that, that seems to be one that we know and can correlate to D and D very simply. So that sounds great. Yeah. I I think that's the main thing is the more I think about it, I'm like, well, that'll probably be helpful. What I'd like to do is talk about the parts of D and D because you guys know D&D, but you don't know what I'm talking about, and then use that knowledge to link it the other way. The idea is while you're playing the game, if it's a TV show, oftentimes um, 
if it's fantasy combat, I get, okay, I don't like fantasy combat because that's part of the problem, right? Combat is, it's fantasy. What you have to do is before the door closes, right? It's a slow closing Indiana Jones door. Before it closes, you have to make it on the other side. Um, there are enemies to fight in this room. There are traps. There are all manner of things, right? It's narrative. That's the point. It's the trap room from Indiana Jones. We're not putting rules on all these things because if we did, we'd have two things and we'd roll a D6 and that would be it. But every round you're in there, you might get hit. You have a chance probably to get hit by a trap, whatever. I mean, my mind is whirling with the possibilities already. But the idea is you're rolling to see if you succeed. But succeed at what? Well, I'm rolling to see if I can add another success to getting us out of this room while the barbarian is rolling to chop that guy's head off. The thing is, in this system, you don't, based on the, what you guys are describing, I'm imagining an endless stream of bad guys. We're now in TV show territory. There are endless goblins in Moria. You are not here to fight everyone. You are here to run away from them. Correct. That is clear. The door Correct. is closing, right? Basically, you can now describe this scene happening and the players are deciding what things they're succeeding at. So I think giving players extra successes in things they're good at, even though that feels like it won't do anything, it allows them, they know they have wild cards, so they have to decide when they're gonna play them. Right? You should set it up in such a way that they, even though they're gonna succeed, they wanna succeed better. And if the door closes, they know the game doesn't end but they feel that they've lost something, right? They're trying to get through the door. Basically separating again that what's fun from what's not, I think allows us to get closer because if I'm the barbarian, I wanna be better at killing guys, but you might be the guy that's better at disarming traps. And if you can do your thing fast enough, maybe we don't have to worry about traps in this room anymore. You've disabled them. Now we can all work harder together to make sure we can get through the door. Again, we're kind of pretending they're not eventually going to succeed, but there's a good argument for there being timers on stuff, but the t end of the timer doesn't mean failure. And you guys basically have that, right? I'm just putting yeah. words to it. And I was just going to say what you just described, and Jeff, feel free to chime in, but that is exact. I you described exactly what we're going for. So as an example, and these numbers, I feel like the numbers we can dial in through playing. Like Let's how many challenge point to put in, right. So the door, the traps, and the goblins, we'll just call it those three, are all a challenge. And each challenge has a number of challenge points you have to do to end them. So exactly as you say, it's not that, and you can do this however you want. It could be an endless stream of goblins. And you decide because there are so many goblins, it is a five it is a five challenge. You will have to get five successes against the goblins to beat them back enough to get through the door. And it's up to the game master if that means you kill all the goblins or if they run away or if there's you route them, whatever. And then the door itself, like you said, you have to do two to, you know, to get there in time or whatever. And then for the traps, to disarm them, maybe that's just a two as well. And... Each of those things has a weakness. So the goblins would probably be strength. The trap would be like intelligence and the door would be dexterity using D&D's stats. And you, at the end of the round, you've done your thing. You tally off X, Y, and Z, how many you did. Then those things do something to you. The traps hit you. The goblins hit you. The door closes a little more. And the idea is that the the way you would fail is that just existing in the world takes away hit points theoretically unless you you're stop the it. timer your player you're, is the yeah. timer yeah. yes exactly yeah you're the timer and and as of now there's not a death it's you just fall to zero whatever that means whether that means you're unconscious or but that's up and to that the, would be that would be per playset it, it would also exactly be the GM, exactly so in yeah, the core and rules per, yeah and per scene even of like if I'm in this room, everybody falling to zero is probably just we're stuck in the room and we'll have to find another approach to get out. Whereas falling to zero in a boss fight might mean somebody dies, you know? So there's a lot of room to still play with like what that means and it doesn't have to be the same in every situation. But what you just said is a rule we just invented, which is 
and we haven't talked about scenes, right? But that gives scenes yeah. a rule. When scenes end, something happens. I know that seems like it doesn't have to be a rule, right? But what we're doing is we're designing, you've designed, Tim, a, a, a resolution mechanic that requires the game master to make something that has tension. As part of the rules, you're taxing the players every round, right? And right, so right, I yeah. want to put a point on that because you can achieve the same thing in D&D, but the rules don't enforce it the way these do. Correct. Exactly, yeah. So to that point, per playset, like fantasy combat, right? Let's say, well, we're going to talk just D&D terms, classes. Uh, the barbarian would be better at killing things. So we're in the room. I'm imagining three people we have, we'll say randomly, barbarian, I say randomly, but barbarian, mage, and um, uh, rogue. I'm going to describe what a power would look like. We're in the trap room. The rogue is probably handling the traps. We'll get to that in a minute. You've described it. You set it up. We got to run to the door, right? For some reason, Tim, in this case, you're the GM. I don't know why I'm not. I'm a player. So me as the barbarian, I know I'm going to get the most mileage out of beating back the goblins. The more successes I get, and I'm going to say this, right? These Some of these may not be rules, but maybe they need to be. The more successes I get against the type of thing that's a creature, right? A creature challenge. It's people attacking me. The less it hits for. Just by saying that, you can give a creature challenge can be the type of thing that somebody can use while they prep. It's not a rule. They can do whatever they want. But hey, just know this type of thing taxes this type of thing. Just by setting that up, that means the barbarian can be better at fighting that type of challenge. So the way you've stacked three different ones, you now have very clear responsibilities. The rogue should be trying to deal with these traps. Well, somebody needs to be keeping the goblins off his back. Who do you think that is? Oh, somebody's, you know what I mean? Like it creates this cool, everybody's kind of doing their own thing, but also working to the same. That means that if the rogue is disabling the traps, that's what they're good at. So they're going to do that. Uh, I think in previous versions of the game, it was kind of like all successes led to everything, maybe. But in this way, by only filling only some successes filling up some buckets, players have to decide which ones they want to do. Now, as part of the five minute RPG system, what you described is the barbarian can go over there and disable the traps. It's not worth his while, but it is if the rogue is dead. So he still can do it. It's just going to take him longer. So you see, by just that, a power could be against creature challenges. You get one extra success. The thing is, that's what the barbarian's good at. He's chopping these things' heads off. Uh, separately, you can have something like healing. But I said mage, but let's pretend it's somebody with healing magic. A mage in this case, right? Healing word. You're not adding successes at all, but you are foregoing your turn to change one of the other dials. I need to heal the barbarian so that he can keep the goblins off the rogue's back. Do you see what I mean? So you're, again, making decisions that all feel like you're, the system is making you feel like you're building to something the players are really just along for the ride. They kind of just won't realize it. And that's, right, I didn't make that up. That's funny. I, I say that like it's some thing, but I'm like, that's what you guys described to me. That's just how I see it. So with that framework, can you see how I would like powers to work? Or like if we could start making some and see where it breaks? So I guess, I mean, I think part of where some of this conversation is like, I won't say breaking down, that's too dramatic, um, is that like, Everything that I've described has been within the context of core rules, and everything you've described has been within context of ex like specific play tests or specific play sets is the right word. So like, I think within a specifically a fantasy system that you could very easily break the game down into like battle traps, you know, that sort of thing, like fantasy breaks down well down into that. So we just have to be okay with saying powers are going to look very different across everything that like if i'm playing a school system versus a fantasy combat system that powers will not be remotely similar in terms of when and how they work like if we're okay with that what what makes them different i want to hear what you think because you described the system right and i described everything that works with the math you you're saying so so in, in what way does it differ so let me i, I guess let me walk slightly back and say the way that powers, the way that we had powers before is that you did not need a qualifier to be able to use them. You did not need to be against a specific sort of challenge. I have my powers. I get to use them. It doesn't matter if I'm trying to kill a monster or if I'm trying to disable a trap. I have my powers that help me, and those powers will help me. Now, basically, 
if we want to have limiting factors to that as far as when you can what challenge you can use your powers against i think that's fine as a possibility we just need to decide that that is going to be in effect because if that is going to be the case then across all the different play sets we need to decide what those different options would have to be for the play sets basically you know yes and and so exactly what you're saying but but I feel like you see it's different, and I understand why you see that. And, and what I want to say is what we are doing is to get the core rules, I think we can do a playset because from there, if you read a lot of playsets, or at least if I did, you could run one on the fly pulling mentally from what you know the playsets to be. So this is where we're – what I'm describing is outside of rules. So to say what you said, what I would like is – for you to be able to compare the different types of um, challenges against each other so that they can be decided. Now, the important thing is all I've done is said, if a challenge has a type, some powers may work with it. But I don't want to remove the idea that the base game we've described still works. And, Basically, and I think... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say something that's really important because I think it, it informs what powers can do is that as the system stands now, if we're still going to include the vulnerabilities, what you described is already baked in with the vulnerabilities. Because the Barbarian will already, if that Goblin Challenge has the vulnerability to Strength, it will already get an extra. Okay. So it's baked so into the challenges, not the characters. So let me say what I'm saying. I was sense? suggesting then, using your words, the type of one type of power I was suggesting is that rather than a challenge having a specific vulnerability, a power allows a player to give a challenge a vulnerability for them. And right? that's so, fair. No, and that's totally fair. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't overlapping the already existing. Because the scene you just described, if the rogue, like, it also, it depends where you put your dice. So that is a variability as well. Like, in other yeah. words, if I'm a barbarian who put my D6 in my strength, just because I get an extra, I'm still not hitting as often. You know what I'm saying? So I, I guess what yeah. I'm saying is the scene you described, the rogue being able to do the traps and the, I could see that working if the rogue doesn't have a medium to high dex die. But as it stands now, the system with the vulnerabilities, the door, the goblins, and the um, traps could already be disabled quicker by people who have those high stats. Exactly. And, and what's interesting is what I feel like, let me put it this way, the core rules have vulnerability and invulnerability on challenges. I guess what I'm suggesting is a playset would add specificity to evoke tone but the reason it's so important to me for it to be playset specific is because i don't feel that it should change the actual rules so i agree with what you're saying basically i think that you have described this you have designed the system you're describing and that the next step is not to add more rules but what we're doing which is to to start to specify like that because i see what you mean right I, i'm changing the system but really what I did is I moved where what decides where it's vulnerable. I made it so that the players, if it's if a scene has vulnerability and invulnerability, it's to everyone. So you've removed the ability for them to make a decision based on it. So it's a way for them to get through it more quickly or half as fast. But if instead you changed it so they got excited when there was a challenge that they were better at. Right, because I'm not suggesting that they roll higher, but they can add more successes. And if they're, I feel like we're describing the same thing. We're just getting caught up in where the rules live, and that's what the Imagine It Better system is kind of all about. That, that's less for the video and more like. So, based on everything we've talked about, can one of you describe a power to me that you think should be in there, or is that the problem that you're saying we don't know? I guess, yeah. I think I think part of the problem is I think too much is trying to be changed in one statement. Like 
the way that you describe things working, James, is, is I think an acceptable solution to say, but the assumption that you've removed vulnerability and substituted that with powers is like not one that was stated ahead of time. And I think that's now like retroactively caught us off guard of like, if your, pro- if your proposal is to say, in this fantasy playset, you remove vulnerability and instead powers grant vulnerability. That is, some, that is a way that you could do it. But that is not necessarily what you had, what I was expecting your solution to be. And I think that's like now flipped us up. So because in my mind, they were still kind of all <laughs> working. Yeah, of like, so if this might be vulnerable to strength and the barbarian gets an extra success, now he's doing three successes per thing because vulnerability is happening, powers are happening. And a power might not necessarily always grant you success. You could, it could heal you. It could, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that it could do. And I think it's okay for all of that to be the case. It's just, I think, like, we've pulled out a thread that was, like, tied to a lot of threads. And, like, things started getting snagged that we weren't expecting to be snagged. And I think that's kind of where things start to get, start to got a little a shaky there. So, yeah. My problem is I feel I see it so clearly. And so please, at any time, ask any questions you guys have, even if it feels obvious because I'm good at forgetting stuff or missing stuff. Same. Yeah. So, so, so I think basically, we just got tied up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but overall, yes, one of the types of powers is like that, right? That would be the basic style. The barbarian would be better at killing stuff. The rogue might be better at disarming traps. Where the game gets interesting is now imagine you have a list of those for the rogue and you have to decide which ones you take. The system is easy because you don't have to make sure anybody, somebody picked disarm traps because anybody can do it. But if nobody picked disarm traps, that's going to be hard later. You see what I mean? So one of the powers can be adding successes. Another one, adding to HP, like we talked about. That's healing. Yep, right? yep, yep, yep. Do you guys want to talk about what other powers? Because I can think of a few other things within the confines we've drawn that could make. I think Jeff had a pretty good list of what, like the stuff you mentioned prior, if we want to jot them down. Um, there yeah, was... I can go back through a couple of those. Okay, yeah. yeah. Because, if you want to yeah, yeah. Because what I'd like to do is look at them and see how they fit into what I'm saying, but still remain the same, right? Just give them the words that I have for them is what I'd like to do. No, and that's yeah. fair. Yeah, so... Yeah, I'll I'll remove so for now I'll remove like the qualifier of like a certain encounter. Just know that we'll pack that back on after. Like at least in my mind, the the main dials that powers could easily affect. Like we said, we're not going to do adding to your role because you're probably already going to succeed. So the things that at least for me an incomplete list that powers can do: add another success, heal or prevent damage, prevent a challenge from taking its turn, you know, something, so stopping an enemy from doing something. Um, Helping an ally, I guess you could say, you know, giving an ally a bonus to something. Um, And knowing that all of those things will be colored by, you know, situations and, you know, the play sets and all that sort of thing. And I'm sure there's more that you could add to that too. I just had one idea while you were talking, and I don't know if this would even be... Well, I'll just throw out the idea and we can fix it, but um, being able to affect more than one challenge per turn. Oh, so take, taking another action is another thing that a power could do. So you get to make two rolls in your turn instead of one, which is mechanically distinct from getting another success because you could, if you fail your roll, another success is useless to you, whereas you get two rolls. You could still get two or you could get one. It's to, it bundles the, the odds differently, so it is like mechanically distinct. And you could then like target actions at different challenges. So you could use one action to disable a trap while you still also get to attack the goblins, you know, or whatever, however it is that you do it. And, and I and think that... Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so I'm going to take a can of worms off the shelf. I'm going to just let you peek inside real quick, and then I'm going to put it back on the shelf, which is because we haven't talked about this at all. As of now, I have gone back and forth between two different ways to handle movement because movement is also a big one that can be a dial to turn where I've currently landed. And I can be swayed can of worms is that you can move anywhere in the scene on your turn. Like a movie. It's rare that 
Honestly, like, I, yeah, I, I, sorry, I don't want to cut you off, but in my mind, movement doesn't exist. Exactly. That, and that, that's where I ended up with it. Now, in certain play sets, you could have movement if that's part of your narrative and you, or you're, you know, you want it to be crunchier. But for now, exactly. It's very narrative. Movement is yeah. not in yeah. the game. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, there's not even movement to consider. The, the rules are you use your actions to, to overcome a challenge. Like, so placement is just not in the rules. Like, it's not something that needs to be covered. And I think it makes sense given that it's a high success system. Like, it's already kind of high flying and, like, people are going to be doing crazy things. Like, do you really need that limiting factor of, like, your crazy thing you don't get to do because you have to use your turn to get to it? It's just, like, it, it feels out of place for me to even to even that's how it felt for me too that in the game and that was a recent development in describing it to you too i was like i think movement needs to go um so so yeah let me one up your can of worms with my can of worms oh no it's 28 ouncer right (gasps) with basil (laughs) here's the thing if we're talking about not playing on a grid yeah movement came because there was a grid. If there's not a grid, it's what you described earlier, Tim. Legacy rules. There's not movement unless we need it. Now, with that said, not to say that we have to do this right, but I have a very simple solution to the concept of some place that's having it. You have designed a system, like we talked about, that builds tension on purpose. So you're very clearly stating like the goal of what's happening, right? So the thing is, if you imagine that like a chase sequence, Using all the rules we described, I'm going to make this up, right? I'm hacking this for my home game. I just make something called zones. I mean, we've talked about that, right? But the thing is, I know about zones because I played this other game. If there's a part of the thing that says sometimes you can have zones, if somebody moves to another zone, the players have to move there. Now you have movement, but it matters. They jump from one train car to the next. It doesn't matter that they moved five feet. It matters that they moved over there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. only put it in if it matters. And you can standardize stuff like that to give people the tools they need. So I yeah. did have an idea. And again, this is like, it's not solving the powers problem, but it might actually, cause it, well, it might add to what you could do. I was toying with the idea in the same way we talked about narrative conditions, where rather than building a system that spits out the fact of how far you can move, I thought there could be certain challenges that are basically you give them an ability called, far and they can use their action to go far which basically means they're out of reach unless you use your action to catch up with them basically it's it's kind of like you can't hurt them this turn because they're far they run faster than you or yeah it's another flavor of not letting damage happen to you but i didn't know if it opened up too big of a can of worms for movement here's the thing so well, okay, you go first. Go okay, I, I think I want to go first because I have something important to say about that. That's what's important. What we're technically doing, in my opinion, is we've moved past designing the game and we are instead hacking the game and in doing so creating a playset. We are making rules that will be transferable to other playsets. I don't think there's another way to go about this, right? I don't think we can make this abstractly and then so... But that's why we're doing it. So to say that is every time you say maybe this, maybe this, we will get to a point where you're not adding more to the five minute RPG anymore. You're adding more to the play sets and that will include rules, right? Only in the event that you need that will you add it to a play set. And the reason I say that is because we are designing a game with that very specific thing in mind. Only The only things your players can do and affect the mechanics are the things you've said so far. And that's the biggest thing people step over when they go, what's AC in my world? They don't consider whether they need it or not, right? Now we're very carefully doing that. And so, but I just wanted, I, we, I didn't say out loud earlier that I feel more like that's what we're doing. Not that that should matter to you guys, but that we think of us not as being able to change the core rules, but instead to use those tools to make what we want. So like you said, Jeff, we probably shouldn't specify what types of encounters there are in the rules. But Tim could write a book that says, here are the types of encounters I prep. Here's a a power I gave my person to work with these. These aren't rules in the game, but if everybody knows what vulnerability means, Tim has sort of a template to make challenges for five minute RPG. And so I think you see what I mean. Like we're, we're, 
we're hacking five minute RPG right now, in my opinion, more than designing it, if that makes sense. Well, yes and no, in the sense of like, these things, so there's, you know, there's the core level and then there's the playset level of like, and we kind of, we're also deciding what goes where. So like it's hacking yeah. unless we decide that it's going to be core, in which case it's not. And I think something that matters too here is just like the way that you frame effects happening changes like the way that you need to present them in the rules of like, so you, you've said like, just, just going back to sp the specific example that you were just talking about, Tim, of like a monster going away, you know, moving far enough away that you can't hit it this turn. You could do that with movement, but then you'd have to add movement to the game. It'd be just as easy to say this thing's, you know, effect that it has when it triggers is you can't target it next turn. Because that's no, all you the cannot game use your action to overcome to the fought. challenge this turn. Exactly. exactly. So the you can describe it narratively as it runs away, but mechanically it just says you can't target this challenge this turn. Like those things are the same. Yeah. And one requires adding a movement system, and one uses the rules as they currently are to get the same effect without needing that. And so I think that that's just as easily a way that you could overcome that challenge of like. Some things will, you know, have their some some challenges will at some point be unavailable to attack. Yeah. And However, that's you great. describe that as fine, whether it's because great. it ran away or because it puts a shield, you know, and or it it's invisible. The narrative of, yeah. yeah. It leaves you that narrative space to play with of things moving in and out of availability without needing to add any subsystems, which I think is a, a more elegant way to do it than trying to now add in this whole extra tagging movement system of close enough or not when you can accomplish the same effect basically with the rules as they are without it if that makes sense exactly and, and that's fair because in, in my concept it's more of a if you don't follow them you fail right the the, the zones moving along you described somebody getting far and i got off into the weeds on if they get far and we want to catch them we have to be in the same place and sure and that then requires and that's but that, that's the interesting part, right? You described that exact thing. If we don't need it, we shouldn't put it in the game. And right. right now, I can't think of a good reason somebody would, as a part of the game, need to be chased. So no, a challenge not getting hit is perfectly good enough for us because as broad as you can make the rule, a player yeah. can make it as specific as they want. Yeah, and you can do a chase in the rules already. That's just a challenge, you know? The challenge is to catch this guy that's what this one challenge is. And you succeed at that challenge in the same way that you see, succeed at other challenges. I'm going to use my quick to try to catch up to him. I'm going to use my intelligence to try to cut him off with this trap. You know, like the, the mechanics can still be followed in exactly the same way. So like just because this person's running and you need to catch them, that doesn't suddenly change the, the core of the game. You can still use the core of the game to do that, you know, because that's kind of the point is that it can do all these different things. So if one of the challenges is catching somebody, you catch them in the same way that you do anything in the game, which is you make rolls and you get challenge points towards overcoming that obstacle, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, no, and, and that makes sense. I, I was busy giving the game state and, and trying not to get too off in the weeds. So yes, what you're saying makes perfect sense. And you're absolutely right. For that type of system, no, we, we would not need much more than that at all. And we follow our own rule of saying, make it a bladed weapon. We're just saying this thing can't be targeted and it can be for any reason that fits. Exactly. You I know, was so, saying yes to the idea no, Tim had rather and that than makes, design, so. No, and that makes a ton of sense. So then we have, and I think we can we can wrap up the video by coming up with the list of what we think the powers can be. And I think I interrupted Jeff, who was about to do that, because I really wanted to, I hadn't, like, breached the topic of movement yet. And I think that's an important thing when you're talking about what rules to break and what can shift if it's a big dial or if it's not a dial. And I think we decided that we're, we'll cover it. So maybe make the first one on the list can't be targeted. Yeah. And, and I think the, the thing I want to say is to some degree, it's funny because this is a, to, this is a part of the imagine a better system in the sense that it's important to me that Jeff felt the need to clarify exactly what he meant, because as humans, it's easy for us to say, yeah, but this too. And you're saying yes, but you know what I mean? So I, I want to say that because what you brought up, Tim, shows us that a lot of what exists in games we don't need to bring with us. Um, 
And to that end, Jeff, the way he described the powers earlier was very much in keeping with the way we described the system because he didn't say what they were. He said, and he didn't say all of these, right? But I sort of made a quick list and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Some of these, adding successes. Um, I did one that was called removing successes because we can get into that later, right? But that's a thing, technically. We could give, yeah. Um, adding to a track, which what Jeff described as healing, right? But um, that is that that one step back, which is, well, I could see a spell that heals their HP, like you said, right? Sure. So by putting it that way, you now have a power that a lot of different people can have depending on what exists in the game and everything. Um, helping an ally, which I think in earlier iterations of the game would be something like a power, but I could see an excuse for later having a cool thing. Um, and then taking another action, which probably is one of the biggest ones, especially if a player can take very specific types of actions, they will always feel like they're doing their thing because they'll kind of always be doing it for free. you know. So yeah, that was the list. Uh, there were sort of a few other nuances there for sure I, that, like you said incomplete list yeah uh, you could, you could break you up some of those into other things too yeah. of like you know healing the healing a point of damage versus preventing the next time you would take you know you could fragment those out into a, 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 exactly. a wider yeah. variety if you wanted more choices but yeah that this was is a place a sort of start. very yeah no absolutely broad list and did yeah. you put can't be targeted no no but that 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 makes sense like I would definitely add that to the list just so that we don't forget it as a set. Because basically what yeah. you're... Well, I said... This I isn't said a prevent, list that I'm keeping. So yeah, I no, said I'm prevent like, yeah. damage, which is... You could in some ways, again, fracture that out into... Can That's what I mean. I'm like, like we can talk about... splitting what, specific yeah. hairs. Okay, got it. Like I, see, point, I see, I see, I yeah. see. Okay, yeah. Okay, These are types sense. of powers we could have, right? But like Jeff said, as soon as you identify a specific one, you go, well, that healing word. This is this other thing. This is... Yeah, yeah. That shield versus healing word. So yeah, yeah, like the the difference between healing, preventing damage, and not being able to be targeted is like all still within the same thing of stopping you from dying. <laughs> you know, yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. You can split the hairs down as much as you want, as far as however many power options you want. You can break these very big categories out into a lot of specifics. But yeah, and, and let me let me tell you what kind of hit me while we were talking about this, which I think it could be cool unless you can see an argument otherwise we could call these the core powers. So this is included in the core rules. These are the core powers. And then the play sets either flavor these things, give like vastly, like you could add, I mean, you could get crazy with it and, and really just make it so that these are all extrapolated with narrative flavor and ideas and breakout boxes to make it super like, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. That's a clever way to use that or for that to be represented and use those and have some, if we think of them, James, as you say, specific to the world, the, for now I would call them playset powers, where it's like, oh yeah, these playset powers include these things that are very specific. Like if you did a Harbinger playset, it would be Astra, maybe, or so, something very, very specific that's like, oh, neat. You know, um, but I think, I think that's, I mean, that's pretty much where we wanted to get today, right? Like that's, that's how yeah, this, yeah. and now it's just yeah. a matter of just kind of trying that out and seeing where the math shakes out and, and all that stuff. Yeah. So I, I do think that like, again, like all the play sets will specifically color these things, but if you wanted to have powers at a core level, I think it'd be very easy to do something like, you know, pick one of these things, you know, out of the list that we already talked about, I won't say them all again, pick one of those and then add a circumstance in which you get to use a type of encounter in which you get to use that. So in this circumstance, I add this effect to this role, you know, and like any specific playset will modify that and flavor it and color it in all these different ways. And you can fiddle with the rules at a deeper level per playset, but like at a fundamental level, that's kind of the, the aim of powers is that, are we all on the same page with that? Yeah. Yeah. I and, think and, so. But the, the thing I want to say about that is what we've done is we've created the templates for the powers that we can then create playsets with. Correct. And exactly. that yeah. is what I think you have to start talking about specific implementation details in order to get there to some degree. Um, Cause it's easier to have a conversation if I have an example than if it's abstract. Oh, sure, yeah. sure, yeah. But I just, so, but that, I feel like I, I wanted to put the cap on what I was trying to describe earlier. I hope it made sense of, hey, if we talk details, we can get higher up, but we can't get the higher up with the details. The reason I want to say that is because you can do whatever you want. 
the way I see it more is that there may be a core playset, but in my opinion, the rules should be abstract and the playsets should be concrete. You can play without a playset. You just have to make it all up. I just think that there is a benefit to putting those all on the same level. This is like super detailed, but technically it will decide kind of some things later and where things belong. And it's the sort of thing where it's that little thread, but some people may not see that pulling it will unravel the whole sweater, but I see that now, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I would just yeah. suggest that. It doesn't have to be, we can put a pin in it, but I would just consider thinking about play sets or implementations of the resolution system um, rather than the way we normally look at it. I suppose I shouldn't have brought that up in the video, but I felt the need to say it based on what you said because it no, I think shows that's it. fair. What just what I wanted to do is try to take the playset level that we basically so basically oh, yeah. the 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 I was end talking goal more is, to what Tim said. Yeah, if you mm-hmm. didn't want a playset, you should still be able to have powers in your game. And I wanted yes. a fundamental that's way to key. say, if you want powers, here's just a quick way to genericize it into whatever moment you need it in right now is like exactly. pick one of those options and pick a circumstance in which you get it knowing so that to- the real goal is that the play sets will do all that for you at a much better level than the abstract core level is but I, even if it is abstract i still wanted there to be a level there because th- we want the system to be usable at that stage if you need it to be and then that's fair the, the main thing i was yeah. clarifying was that tim mentioned he would have something as part of the core rules. And, and that was what you're saying is a good point because what we've done is what I said earlier, we put up the bumpers. We said, hey guys, these are the yeah. types of things. You don't have to pick one of these. So as part of the core rules, we, what we're doing is we're making, I'm going to call them roll tables because we know that, right? You could technically use them that way. We're making mm-hmm. roll tables for powers. If you yeah. want to make it, all you have to do is skin these things. We've already done the work. Correct. You can add them if yeah. you want. So and that that's, that's the distinction goal. is very important. The, yeah. And, yeah. and to, to really heavily hit on Jeff, what you said, so, and James, exactly. I want people to be able to have this small little book, whatever shape, size, and, you know, format it comes in. And if they're like, ah, dude, I super just want to be a Terminator. I just want to be the Terminator. You could say that, position your stuff, and then just scroll down and go, oh, that that's probably Terminator-y. Like, and you're off to the races. It also, what I didn't want to mention until we got to a place where I knew that we were in like, okay, let's put the key in the lock at least. It also allows for you to play games without powers. And I think that is also a good option if you want to do something that feels different. It's just like, hey, if you don't want your players to have powers, you don't have to either. So it's a little bit of good both and there. What we've done, if you make the rules like that, what you know, sort of what I described where they're abstract, and especially the more you give those vague things, where if you say, if you make all your players have one of these types of powers, for example, you'll get a game at the end. What I think that creates is a thing where what you said to him, oh, maybe you can play without powers. Somebody will come up with a reason that they added something else that's not powers to their five minute RPG mm-hmm. that somehow simulates, you know, some weird thing that you never thought of. Right, you made an RPG role-playing game system, but we've given them the tools to make what they wanted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is the important concept because, and I know like it feels like I'm probably, I, 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 in conversations like this, I'm sure it feels that my pedantry knows no bounds, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's that literal distinction that is what games are now and what games will be when we make this. You know what I mean? So sorry to harp on it just so hard, but that, is so important where I'm like, we're not even making a game at this point. We're just going to happen to use the tools we created to play a game. <laughs> Does that make sense? I it's it's kind of like... I think it ahead. does. I think it does. I think the, the challenge will be that it is both things at the same time. Yes. It because is certainly, we're consciously yeah, yeah. thinking of both things that exactly. you, we're, we're doing both at the same time. We are making a, yeah. a system and then figuring out how it then retrofits into a framework. But, and that's what's interesting is most people don't do that second part. So fate may be a great system, but if I don't have in my mind the types of things they were thinking when they were thinking aspects, sure. I'm going to fail at making a good fate game. Sure. So what we're doing is just taking that extra step to going, here's what we had in mind. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to stop talking now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, two other things, because we're at about an hour and 35 minutes um, that I probably shouldn't even bring up, but I'm like, why not? Um I had an idea for the D4, which was in some form or fashion, 
if I use my turn to help someone else, I can give them a D4 on their next turn. Something like that where I'm what I'm trying to accomplish with that is by the act of taking your turn to help someone else being the good feeling you get. Now, I don't know if that would be worth it in a high success system, but in a in a system where things might not be going well and you need a guaranteed success, it would be like an all stops, like, hey, I'm going to give you my D4 and actually my turn is going to be you. I don't know. That was one idea. Um, so you don't have to answer that or we, you can even edit that out of the video. I just want you to be thinking about it. And then the second thing is, um, once we have this, like, I'm going to try to start like writing this out and and you're welcome to join me. Um, but I think another video we could do is actually trying the game loop and just seeing how this stuff holds up, like rolling some dice and just saying, wow, this feels really good or okay. I think it would go a long way with these two theoretical videos where we just kind of talk game design for people to see where we ended up with it and how it plays out. Yeah. So, um, so I guess that's pretty much it, right? Do you want to, is there anything else you all want to say? Yes, but <laughs> that's not the right question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't have question. Is there anything else you feel deserves to be in a video at the end of a video this long? Say, to that, I, I would no. absolutely respond to the whole D four thing that you just suggested. Exactly, I have a I'm whole like... spiel I could go into about what I think it would, but that would be another entire thing. Okay, and that's fair. And so maybe yeah, that's yeah, a vo- exactly. maybe that's a voice message. Like, uh, that's fine, and that's totally fine. Um, but this will this conversation we had, we at no point decided really technically anything. This will give us all the fuel. No, we the next did. time we talk about it. No, but I'm just saying, like, yeah. the funny thing is this feels like the end, but it's only the beginning. Like, I know that you, you oh, know, but, like, yeah. for most people out there, they would go, oh, yeah, they made a game. And I'm like, no, 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 it didn't even get started. <laughs> we got on the same page. So right. next yeah. time we can talk about it. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, no, it's true. Because there are still other elements that need to be accounted for that we really can't get into right now, which is, so one, the D4, and then the other one be considering what the D20 is. Right now, the D20, so that you know, is each player rolls it, and that's what decides what challenge is in the room. Now, that might not work well if the Game Master has prepared some stuff. But the the reason, this was called the story die, and the reason why I did that is because the D20 is so swingy. So two problems to consider, and none of it is in stone. We don't have to figure it out. What do we do with the D4 that literally can't roll a five? And what do we do with the D20 that is so swingy that it would just break a lot of the math if it was used for things other than narrative stuff? So, um, Or, this would be the only thing I say, or if what you're getting from the die roll is what number it lands on. Oh, so it's not a matter of how high or low it is. It's Doesn't literally just... Right. Start thinking like that, you know? Well, because and that's, that's what obvious, right? That's but what I'm the like... story tables were. It was like everybody would roll yeah. and that was the scene. So it was I just, at the beginning specific, of the scene, yeah. it only it was, happened yeah. once. It was I just wanted a to way point to out like that you said create oh, a yeah. scene without the GM needing to make it of just like yeah. everyone roll their D20. Like that's what monsters here, that's what the room looks like, you know, is that. Exactly. Sort of thing. I-, I was being pedantic in the sense that you said the D20 is swinging, but that is not technically true. It the is number within the, the it, oh, no. Well, that's it is, what I mean. It, it depends on within, what you're getting. Well, I mean within the stat system. Pedantry knows no bounds. That's what I'm saying. Within the context, really you roll it, into a stat. But if yeah. you roll yeah. it and it's odds or evens, you now only have two, right? It's not swinging anymore. That's the sort of thing that I'm like. If you know that, you design games differently. So that is true. No, and that's true. And that's and that's all. Where I'm like, it's I promise it's swinging in the context thing. of the stat system, which is what he was saying. If we use the number. That's that what is I mean. what the I'm stat like, system yeah. is, though. That's what the stat system is. The, the stat system is. You use is roll the number to roll over higher. five. So, yeah. So within the system that's defined, that is a swingy so die. Within specifically the goal of rolling a dice to get a five or a higher. Oh, to get the over D20s. five. Yeah, yeah. I meant yeah. specifically. And that's what, yes. I meant specifically that's what, and that's the where, stat <laughs> system. Exactly. But that's where I wasn't saying anything about five-minute RPG. I wanted Tim oh, to know I was. <laughs> that there was another layer to the sure. D20. And that's fair. And that's totally fair. What I meant was in specific to the five minute RPG and this being a stat, this would just be. And that's fair. There's no good way to explain to people that if you start saying things more specifically, you'll start thinking them that way too. So 
I should have set that up more, but to say alone that the D20 is swinging is not true. And in the context of, of, of game design, I think it's important that you know that. I'm being pedantic so that you can learn that. So I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean no, to- No, 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 you're fine. I understand that no, I was no. not clarifying. Game. And I yeah, under, yeah. I'm not like a stat wizard or anything, so- No, totally. But yeah. I just, I just yeah. So. there's a reason every time I'm that specific and I want you guys to know, it just has nothing to do with that. No, that's fair. I um, Well, let's end the video. And uh, they'll all figure out it. Uh, so, so we'll do something like this. All right. Uh, so that is us just designing the five minute RPG and uh, warts and all. It's there is. It's not really a clean process designing games. It's. It, hopefully, it will be when Imagine It Better is done. But right now, it reminds me a lot of like hacking a trail. And you have to figure out if where you end up after hacking that trail is where you want to be or if you have to go back and hack a new trail. And so um, we're a bunch of hacks. No, the uh, the thing that I would say is comment on this video, um, just it, it, in terms of this sort of video, did you take value from it? Hopefully the the game design was helpful for you to hear other designers talk things out and hopefully it inspired you and gave you ideas for your system and um just even the theory and the logic and all that kind of stuff we we could talk about it as we have proven for hours um but just put in the comments what about you what's um you know something about game design that maybe we spurred in you or that we missed or is there a big concept that we're overlooking what interested you you know just anything uh, but we're tabletop terrors. We love fun. We try to be creative and we love designing and playing RPGs. If you like that kind of thing, consider subscribing because we come out with a video every week uh, that features those things. We end all of our videos with a Tabterian toast. So join us in that. May you mend the first break. May you kill the first snake. May you conquer everything you undertake. I remember when I learned about uh, Settlers of Catan, which is how I say it, like Chris Catan. Uh, some people say Catan, I don't know how it's said. You're going to realize at the end of this that it doesn't matter. When I found out how um, big Catan was, right, it, had, it had just won a bunch of awards. It's kind of won a very popular board game. I thought, okay, I want to know how this person designed it because they must, they must know what they're doing. Right? And I basically found out that it was a German guy, and I, it was probably a smart guy, right? He designed and published a board game that there's some know-how there. The thing is, the story I read about it just described him hacking through the dark, making his, I say making because the article implied that he was making, making his family play test it for him, and he continued to do that until he found the The The, the, pay, the story I, uh, uh, picture I just painted, right, sounds like he's trapping his, his family in the basement. <laughs> you know what I mean, I think, but the idea is there was no special system. And when I learned that as somebody that felt like they really wanted to design games, it pained my heart so much to know that I couldn't read the same book as him and make him a game. <laughs> and inadvertently, I kind of found that there isn't a way, right? There's no book you can read. You kind of just have to learn and play games and talk about it like this. So um, I just want to say to anybody, there's no magic bullet. Catan was made by some guy in his basement, you know, making his family play test until it was good. And he got lucky, you know, in some fashion. So keep designing games, I guess. That was great. Yeah. Yeah.